Thank you, Kathy. Our God is an awesome God. What a wonderful way to launch our service today. Hello and welcome to St. Paul United Methodist Church. This is our online service for the week of Sunday, March 7th, and we are very glad you've joined us today. The scripture appointed for today's service is from the uh, Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 20, beginning at verse 1, and it reads like this. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've titled today's message, no fake gods. The scripture this morning that I just read is from the NRSV Bible, which is what most Methodist churches uh, commonly use in the pulpit. There are several translations or paraphrase writings of the Ten Commandments uh, in, in uh, what I would call more modern terms. And I really like this one, no fake gods. That's really pretty clear, isn't it? If you are not sure who or what you're worshiping, that is a fake God. There are lots of fake gods that are pretty easy to spot. We see them all the time in other people. Sometimes it is a little harder to recognize when we are worshiping them too. This is not a political statement other than to say any politician, regardless of party, that, that the media describes in too glowing of terms concerns me a little bit in this regard. Movie stars, rock stars, TV stars, they also seem to be subject to public acclaim, and some would say that is even worship. There's a gospel song I love that says America has no more superstars, and now we call them idols. Idols is certainly another description of fake gods. The American public often comes dangerously close to worship in our attitude toward many of these public figures. The two fake gods a lot of people seem to worship are one, self, and two, 
the world. And I want to talk about that for a few minutes. Worship of self tries to put God into a manageable box. Worship of self puts a person's individual wants and needs and ego before everybody else, especially God. Science of self-worship include ignoring the rules and laws that everybody else abides by. Self-worshippers don't go to church because there's no reason for them to think of anything as more important than themselves. Self-made men often worship their creator, said uh, Bryant McGill. He's an author, and I'm going to have to read his book. I think I like that. But uh, Peter Coyote, an actor who you would probably recognize if you saw his picture, said the self is just not a worthy enough vehicle to worship. Former President Carter said too many of us try to worship self-indulgence and consumption. And I think that's true, too. All those statements are accurate. Though I would add that there are certainly some self-made women who do some of the same things. I uh, also want to say that self-worshippers do come to church from time to time, but they usually make sure that they are coming to the right church. They also may make a grand show of all they're doing to help all those little people around them. I don't know any self-worshipping folks at St. Paul Church, but I wonder if any of you are thinking of someone you know in this category. Hmm. It's very sad, though because eventually it's going to catch up with them. Judas Iscariot was a self-worshipper. He said he was upset when Mary poured out that expensive nard to anoint Jesus. But Judas was the keeper of the disciples' cash, and he would have preferred to sell that expensive oil and keep the money for himself. Those who worship the world are going to look a great deal like the self-worshipping crowd. In fact, I have no doubt there's some overlap there. Those who worship the world tell you they don't need to go to church to find God. But what are they really doing? What are they really saying? Aside from playing golf on Sunday mornings, they're really lying to themselves and to the world. Self-worshippers and world worshippers are more concerned with how many people read their tweets or read their blog than anything else in the world. Now, this is not meant to vilify well-known people. There are lots of religious believing individuals who just so happen to be rich and famous. It is also not a criticism of you if you follow your favorite movie star on Facebook or Twitter or every morning in USA Today. It is a question, rather, of what we value as practicing Christians. It's a question of what examples are we setting for those who are following in our footsteps as the next generation of St. Paul Church. It's a question of where we spend our time, talent, and treasure. My hope for the next two or possibly three Sundays before Easter is that we all will, will, will come to think about Jesus Christ coming to earth to restore us to right relationship with God. We'll remember he came to change the world in a way that the old Jewish laws never did. He also came to help us see worship of self and worship of the world will always, always leave us longing for true peace and happiness. The Quest Study Bible notes, uh, they say that Jesus did not abolish the Old Testament laws because God's revelation cannot be abolished. They say he fulfilled the old laws by providing a better sense of what holiness looks like. That is such a nice description. Jesus shows us what holiness looks like. You want to know holy? No, Jesus. That is why it's so important that we as Christians understand the Ten Commandments. We also need to understand Jesus' relationship to the Ten Commandments and to all of God's laws. We need those understandings because whether we like it or not, at some point in life, our actions as a member of St. Paul Church or any church, as, as a believer in Jesus Christ and a lover of God, we will be all that some other person has in their life to understand who God is and who Jesus is. That's quite a responsibility. They will view God and his son through 
your interpretation of how you live out the Ten Commandments. We've all heard about the Ten Commandments before, right? I'm going to go over ground that's been plowed before in this church and in every church. If you don't remember the commandments from church, most of us have seen the movie, right? The Ten Commandments were given by Charlton Heston, or um, <laughs> Moses, at the summit of Mount Sinai as the Jews had wandered through the wilderness looking for the Promised Land. God wrote them down on stone tablets and Heston, um, Moses, came down the mountain where his brother and the rest of the Jews who had fled Egypt were still trying to figure things out and were doing what I like to describe as stupid stuff. In addition to no fake gods, the plain English translation of the first commandment is also very simple. Are you ready? Put God first. We can all remember that one. Put God first. There were so many laws for the Jews. The Ten Commandments are just the first of 613 Jewish laws categorized in something called the mitzvot. That was a, a summary document produced in the 12th century. It summarized all the laws into various categories. Now, I'm not going to run through all 613, though I did read them. I did. But I want to do uh, just list just a few for you. There were laws about animal sacrifices, of course. There were laws about forbidden foods, laws about credit, relationships, oaths and vows, mixed species of seeds. Hmm. Probably no brocco flower in Jewish law. And laws about mixed species of animals. So I am guessing no cockapoo dogs in traditional Jewish households even today. Today we're just looking at the first two of the Ten Commandments. There are eight more that we'll talk about later. I added the plain English version for simplicity. Like I said, number one, Put God first. It seems pretty easy when you stop and think of it that way. Put God first. Okay. We're certainly reminded of that during this period of Lent, but I think there's so much more to it that we might not always consider. Consider this. If it really was easy to put God first, we probably wouldn't need the second law. No fake gods. No fake gods is really tough in today's world. Every young person thinks about having their 15 minutes of fame, and some of us a little bit older, okay, a lot older, probably still have some of those thoughts as well. I am putting God first, but today I'm doing that by fill in the blank of what is usually an excuse for not doing what we know we really should be doing. Are we putting God first all the time? Probably not, though I agree we are trying every day to do a little bit better every day. Are we creating other gods by our inability to be laser focused on putting God first? Now that's a tougher question. I am a firm believer of getting out into God's creation and enjoying the beauty of the state of Texas. But I don't believe those trips always need to happen on Sunday morning. Sometimes they do, but not always. You can find Jesus on a mountaintop, but you can also find him among your friends and your church family. You can even find him on your phone if you are watching this service on video today. Though I am not sure you will have phone service if you're up on the top of that mountain we were talking about. So we need special time to focus our hearts toward God. We need to be reminded of the message brought forward. And the first two pieces of that are pretty simple when we boil it down to those six words. Put God first. No fake gods. The Ten Commandments were displayed outside many government buildings in our history. I believe they are still standing in front of some state capitals, especially here in the South. I know that we saw them on the Capitol grounds in Little Rock a couple of years ago. We have to have faith and understanding that the commandments are the word of God. 
They are moral laws that were first laid down by God to tame an uncivilized world. And not much has changed in thousands of years. We're still pretty uncivilized. We need to spell out the consensus of what the legal system determines to be right and wrong too. Our own civil codes are most often based on the morality that is spelled out in the Ten Commandments. Many people today don't do a whole lot better at keeping all the civil laws than the Jews did in ancient history. We joke about the 613 laws of the mitzvot, but every state legislature and the Congress write hundreds of laws every year. We can't keep them all straight. In Denver and Seattle, you can buy marijuana. <laughs> in Texas, you are prohibited from buying beer and wine on Sunday morning. It's enough to confuse even the best lawyers. And that is why Jesus brought us a new command in Luke 10, 27. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Or as we said just a minute ago, no fake gods. Your love of God will give you the strength to meet the daily challenges of life in the year 2021. Depending on anything other than God will eventually bring each of us back to the realization that the only thing we can depend on is God. COVID-19 is surely an example of all the inconsistency of worshiping or trusting the world. Different experts believe different things. We are all caught in the crossfire of competing political and social values that try to define how we should be living our lives through the COVID-19 pandemic. We can only trust in God to see us through that jungle that we're, we're not quite through yet. Now that Texas has lifted state mandates, the governor is either the greatest guy in the state of Texas or the biggest fool to ever live in the governor's mansion. I'm not choosing sides on that and I would encourage you to stand back from that decision as well. I understand there's no middle ground there. So regardless of how you interpret the governor and the decisions he announced this week, can we agree that prayer for our state and our country is still in order? It, it is still the only answer. Can we agree to trust in God to know when the masks can come off? Can we agree that the only one who really cares about every person in this world is God? The only Real God is the one who brought the Ten Commandments to Moses to bring order to the chaos that was life following the captivity of the Jews in Egypt. Today, the one who promises to never leave us, the one who promises to bring us home to be with him in heaven, is not a politician or a rock star or a movie star or a religious leader. The one who has a place for us in his heart and a home waiting for us in heaven is the Lord God Almighty, and that is no fake God. Amen. Hosanna, Lord, Hosanna, the little children sing through hill and court and Redeemer, the Lord of heaven. Above. 